I love tinkering with computers and seeing what all they can do, but if we're being honest, typical consumer PCs can get a little dull. That's why I'm always on the hunt for things like this. This little PC may have been designed for one specific purpose, but today we're going to explore what hidden features it might have, how it can be repurposed in interesting and useful ways, and why it might just earn a permanent spot in my home lab. One day, while perusing through eBay listings, I came across this PC from Seneca. Based off of the title and the existence of four HDMI ports, it was clear that this was designed for digital signage. But I also noticed the dual NICs, modern Intel processor, and this HDMI input. Well, what could have been an HDMI input, obviously it wasn't punched out. But all of those potential features and the simple industrial case had me really intrigued, and I won the auction for just a little over $100 in total. I didn't look up the specs, so I really didn't know if that was a good or bad deal, but I was already pretty set on checking it out. When I first got it out of the packaging, I was a bit surprised at how clean it was. I didn't expect a ton of scrapes or dents since I imagined this would have spent most of its life tucked behind some TVs or something, but I at least expected some dust or goop. But as I said, it looked to be in really good condition. However, I did immediately notice the first big issue. So I didn't realize it doesn't have a power adapter. Dang it. If only it used a USB-C port, then I could have easily powered it from this adorable Uno Charger 100 watt from today's sponsor, Ugreen. The face on this cute little guy isn't just for looks. It tells you whether it's in standby mode, fully charged, or fast charging. And speaking of fast charging, it can provide up to 100 watts on either of the two top USB-C ports, perfect for any of your devices. In fact, it can charge an iPhone 15 Pro from 0% to 60% in just 30 minutes. Plus, with the four ports, you can plug in all of your devices, including something like this other cute little guy, the Uno 2-in-1 Magnetic Wireless Charger 15 watt, which also includes a helpful, friendly face. But this little dude has some other fun features. With its Qi 2 certified magnetic wireless charger, it not only can charge my iPhone, but also my AirPods thanks to the 5 watt charger on the back. And with another USB-C port on the side, I can easily charge my Apple Watch as well. This thing has definitely earned a spot on my nightstand. If you're looking to pick up some fast and fun charging accessories for the new iPhone or other Apple devices, make sure to check out the Ugreen Uno Magnetic Wireless Charger 15 watt, Uno Charger 100 watt, and the rest of the Uno series by checking out the links in the description below. To sort out the power supply issue, I first looked up the specs and manual, but all I could find there was that it used a 60 watt external power supply. Before plugging in random power adapters, I decided to open it up and investigate a bit more. I meticulously disassembled the case by... I'm kidding, I think I managed to take it apart in the least efficient way possible, removing way more screws than necessary. At least they're conveniently all the same size. I eventually got down to the motherboard, and while I could at least confirm the polarity, there was no hint as to the input voltage of the power supply. I also noticed that this little system blower fan was unplugged, so I just decided to plug that back into the fan header. Which would have been easier if there was a fan header. Well, there technically was a header that I could plug it into, but it was labeled SATA power, and I didn't want to assume it would work, so I just left it unplugged. And the SATA power header wasn't the only interesting thing. There also appeared to be headers for some non-existent front panel audio and USB 2 ports, as well as even a GPIO header. I was a bit surprised that for a system with an 11th gen Intel CPU that there was also a mini PCIe slot. Well, actually mini PCIe or mSATA slot depending on which pins were jumped on this little header here. Below that was a SIM card slot, and there was also a Wi-Fi adapter in an M.2 E key socket, as well as a 256GB SATA SSD in the B and M keyed M.2 socket. There were also two 4GB DDR4 SODIMM modules, and on the back there was a CPU cooler for the Intel i3 1115G4 a dual-core 4-thread mobile CPU released back in 2020. Sadly, as expected, there was no sort of HDMI capture card or anything. My guess is that there would have been some sort of optional capture card in the mini PCIe socket that my variant didn't have. Oh yeah, I should probably talk about the other external I.O. On the front, there's a power button. And on the back, there's a threaded DC barrel jack, two gigabit NICs, four USB 3 ports, four HDMI ports, and connectors for Wi-Fi antennas. Oh yeah, and it also comes with this cool built-in mounting mechanism. It seems like this could be a pretty cool system to play with. That is, if I could power it on. I only had one adapter that would fit the threaded jack on the back, which was a 12 volt 4 amp power supply. 48 watts was less than the 60 watt spec, but I was only planning to see if it posted. I also figured if it needed something like a 19 volt power supply, 12 volts wouldn't hurt, so I gave it a shot. Yeah, we got a post. Oh, kinda. 
That's a bit odd, don't you think? Okay, yeah, that was weird. But it only happened when I was trying to boot over the network, and the BIOS looked totally normal. Well, it looked pretty normal, but actually had a lot of features available, including what seemed to be settings for the GPIO header I mentioned earlier. I also noticed that the two gigabit NICs aren't the same. One is an Intel i211, and the other is an i2019-V. Honestly, I'm not entirely sure why they're different. With my multimeter, I also double-checked the voltage on the SATA power header, and it turns out that the two pins on the right were ground and 5 volts respectively, which mapped to the corresponding wires for the fan, and sure enough it worked. It worked really well actually, but the noise was a bit annoying. Also sadly, my hopes of being able to hook up 3.5 inch hard drives to this were crushed when I found there was no 12 volt pin on that SATA power header. Also, I should mention that I did reach out to Seneca's support team, well, actually, the company that has since bought out Seneca, but they were kind enough to let me know that this system would work with any 12 volt or 19 volt power supply as long as it provided 60 watts. Fortunately, in the meantime, I had already found a 90 watt 12 volt power supply that worked just fine. Before doing any testing, I wanted to make sure it had fresh thermal paste, but this probably was a mistake as, well, the thermal paste that was on the system was pretty much perfect. That didn't stop me from spraying it with isopropyl alcohol and scrubbing it until it was squeaky clean. Now normally this is the part of the video where I would dust this thing off and clean it up, but like I said, it was pretty much dust free already. So really all that was left to do was just assemble all of these parts. Oh, that was pretty quick. With the system put back together, I wanted to see how well the i3-1115G4 performed and what power consumption looked like. And I also wanted to test out some of the ports on the board like the GPIO header for example. When installing Debian 12, I ran into a small hiccup, which is that the Intel i211 NIC wouldn't work during the install, so I had to switch to the i219-V. Once I got Debian installed though, I was able to get both NICs working just fine. After running PowerTop's autotune function and unplugging everything from the board except power and networking, the total system power draw at idle dropped down to around 6 watts. Not bad. The CPU performance of the i3 wasn't quite as amazing though. In Sysbench when running the CPU test with 4 threads, the dual core Tiger Lake chip barely managed to outperform a Raspberry Pi 4. Granted, when running a single threaded benchmark, it looked much better. In Cinebench R23, the i3-1115G4 managed a multi-threaded score of 2624 and a single threaded score of 1206. For comparison, I grabbed the results of an i7-8700 and a Lenovo P330, as well as from an N100 mini PC. The single-threaded performance of the i3 was basically right on par with an 8th gen i7-8700, but didn't come close in terms of multi-threaded performance. However, it managed to outperform the true quad-core Intel N100 in both tests. When looking at power draw on Windows, we see that the 1115G4 managed to draw significantly less power under load than the 8700, but drew about twice as much power as the N100 system both at idle and when running Cinebench. I didn't buy this system for the CPU though, I bought it for all those fun ports and such. To make sure the M.2 E key slot was wired up for PCIe, I swapped out the Wi-Fi card with a little M.2 E key dual SATA adapter. That showed up correctly in hardware info, so I guess if you wanted, you could make a little 2-bay NAS out of this or something. The mini PCIe slot was already configured for M SATA, so I popped in an M SATA SSD, which also worked just as expected. I started to move the jumper to the PCIe position, but... Oh no, I dropped it. That's gone forever. Fortunately, I have some spares. I plugged in a mini PCIe Wi-Fi adapter, but it was only a half-length card, so I just got to hold it in place. Still, it showed up as expected. Now, realistically, I was expecting all of those to work, but what I wasn't sure about was that GPIO header. I've really only messed around with the GPIO on Raspberry Pis and a couple of microcontrollers. Not an x86 board like this. To start off, I enabled it in the BIOS, but noticed there were only settings for 8 pins, and the header had 12. I was at least able to confirm that the 8 pins in the BIOS did in fact line up with the first 8 pins on the header, but when I ran GPIOD in Debian, there were 360 available lines. I had no idea what would correspond to what. I wrote a script, or really, ChatGPT helped me write a script, that would just cycle an output pin every second, and as an example, it just used line 4. I figured I would just cycle through all of the lines until I could eventually identify one of the pins with my multimeter, but I'm not lying when I tell you the first pin I tested, pin 2, was the pin that correlated with line 4. I have no idea how I got so lucky. I didn't have any immediate ideas on what to do with this other than making this little LED flick on and off, but I'm sure there are plenty of interesting projects that this could come in handy for. Put your suggestions down in the comments. It was cool to see everything working as expected, but what could this system actually be used for? Well, obviously this could be used as a simple desktop system, or you could set it up as a home server to run various services. 
You could also use it as a digital signage machine, I guess, but I had two ideas I thought would make a lot of sense. The first would be as a router, possibly even a travel router. With the dual NICs and Wi-Fi antenna connections, you could install something like OpenWRT and use this as a router and wireless access point. And if you wanted, you could possibly even use the mini PCIe slot to add in a cellular modem and SIM card to have a wireless WAN connection for when you travel or something. I considered and even started trying to set something like this up, but quickly realized it was going to be a project outside the scope of this video. Because what I really wanted to try out was setting this up as an NVR using something like Blue Iris. And there are a few reasons for this. First of all, the dual NICs could also be useful here. You could connect your network with one, and then isolate all of your cameras on a separate network or VLAN using the other. With the M.2 and PCIe slots, you could not only add in more storage or faster networking, but also drop in something like a Coral TPU for object detection. And with all four HDMI ports, you could even hook up a bunch of monitors if you wanted to have an actual surveillance station. So I downloaded Blue Iris, as well as Code Project AI, which would handle the object detection. For that though, I wanted to use one of those Coral TPUs. I already own one, but it's currently in my little Proxmox mini PC. So, since I already had one of these in an M.2 E key form factor, I bought a mini PCIe version, but forgot about the whole half length card thing. So I took some measurements, realized that was pointless because mini PCIe is a well-documented standard, threw together a design and printed it out. The TPU was recognized, and after a bit of tinkering, I got my camera set up and object detection working. Now, I only have a few cameras, so using a project I found on GitHub, I set up a stack in Portainer to spin up a bunch of RTSP streams so that I could pretend like my little surveillance setup was doing something important. I grabbed a few old extra monitors, but ran out of VGA adapters, so I grabbed the little portable HDMI monitor and eventually had a sweet little surveillance setup with multiple monitors. Now you might have remembered at the beginning of this video, I mentioned that this Seneca mini PC might have found a place in my home lab, and that's sort of true. I wasn't just testing out Blue Iris for the sake of this video, I was also testing it out to see if I wanted to switch to that, rather than continuing to use Surveillance Station on my old Synology NAS. Now rather than hooking it up in the closet that has all of my networking gear and servers, I actually used the mounting mechanism to attach it to the bottom of this table in my living room. And I figure after I get a little HDMI switch or something, I can hook that computer directly up to my TV to be able to quickly and easily monitor Blue Iris if I want, or I could even use it as a little home theater PC as well. And yeah, it might be a little bit weird that it's not in the closet with all of my other networking gear and such, but it also means I have a computer in the living room that can do multiple things and is not contributing more heat to that little closet. And sort of in a sense, if someone were to break into my house and steal everything out of the networking closet, they probably wouldn't find the little mini computer tucked underneath the table. So if for some reason someone did steal both of my TrueNAS servers that would have the security footage backed up to it, I would still have the first copy that would still be on the SSD on my Blue Iris machine in the living room. So that's probably not gonna happen, but I like the fact that I can run Blue Iris on that computer in the living room and have access to it, but also use it for streaming games to my living room or something. So we'll see how well this goes, but it seems like that little Seneca mini PC might have actually solved a real world problem for me. For $100, I feel like this was a pretty good deal. The performance is pretty solid, there are good features that offer flexibility, but most importantly, this thing is just a lot of fun to mess around with. Now, odds are you won't be able to go out there right now and buy something exactly like this for a good price, but maybe keep your eyes peeled for a good deal to pop up. Who knows, something like this might be your next project. I had a ton of fun making this video, and I hope you had fun watching it as well. If so, maybe consider giving this video a like and watching a few more. That's about it for this one though, so as always, thank you guys so much for watching, stay curious, and I really can't wait to see you in the next one.